Have you got the YouTube? Yeah. Yep, it's streaming now. So if you've got that open, then just make sure it's muted. Hello, everyone. It's um, great to see so many of you here um, again for our third online research forum seminars. It's a particular pleasure to welcome Adam Swain, who's a, a wonderful, known as a wonderful colleague to many of us. Um, and I'll, I'll give a, a short, a very, very short introduction. He was an alumnus of the RNCM on the joint RNCM University of Manchester course, which is, produces often some wonderful people such as Adam. Um, he studied uh, at Northwestern in the, in the US, I believe, and uh, for a, a doctorate in performance, but with a, a strong musicological element too. He's got many, many talents. Um, as a, um, a performer, composer, musicologist, he does it sort of all. He came in, in 2017 as a lecturer to the RNCM and very, very recently he was appointed deputy head of the School of Keyboard Studies and we're all very delighted for him. Um, his, um, he works regularly with Kevin Malone and um, his CD, New Music, New Politics, Speak To Me, I've got that the wrong way around, um, won a sort of BBC uh, music magazine particular um, award or, or um, recognition, I should say. He's the programme director for the Riot Ensemble. Um, and so today he's going to talk about the German composer Ferdinand Ries and an area of his research which is on the, the 19th century concerto. Please welcome Adam Swain. That is very kind, thank you Barbara. Gosh, blushing, <laughs> that's a lovely introduction, thank you. Oh, it's nice to see you all. Uh, I do miss you, I must say. Um, welcome to my flat. Uh, the reason I say that is <laughs> We might be interrupted a couple of times by the mods and rockers tearing up Brighton Seafront in their motorbikes. That happens um, several times each day. It's, it's bound to happen at some point. Um, we ought not to be interrupted by anything else, although my internet has a habit of going down um, about once every day. If that happens, talk amongst yourselves for two minutes. I'll be back. <laughs> right, so um, this the point of this series is um, what we've been up to during lockdown. And um, as with many other, uh, well, all, all live performers, anyone that um, relies on, on the sustenance um, emotionally and financially of live performance, there's been a few gaps in my diary. So um, I've used those to really crack on with my edition of a concerto by Ferdinand Ries. And this is based on a discovery I made in the Berlin State Library in 2005. Uh, Rees was fastidious and organised. He kept manuscript copies of most of his published works, and he was very, very careful to make sure there was only one copy of each. But in this case, for this concerto, he left two copies. And I thought, well, that's pretty unusual. I wonder why he did that. And 15 years later, I've been researching and I think I've found the answer. And the answer in a nutshell is, he didn't publish the original version, published the later version instead. The original version has been um, sitting there unplayed and unloved since 1806. But the fact he kept it, the fact that he um, uh, clutched onto the manuscript seems to suggest that this piece had a special meaning for him. So I've been trying to unpack what that is. And the first stage naturally was to take the manuscript and to typeset it. Hopefully you're seeing um, whizzing past your eyes at the moment, uh, a few pages from my typesetting. You know, I'm gonna be brave and call it my edition now because I've worked, uh, I've, I finished it. Uh, I've even finished the commentary that goes with it. So um, all sorts of fascinating things such as uh, uh, solo passages for wind instruments indicated by one and two instead of blah, blah, blah. Panic not. The talk is not going to be on the finer details of, of how to do uh, an edition. Instead, I'm hoping to broaden it out into something that uh, hopefully everyone can relate to. But this is going to be a challenge. This is quite a niche topic. Um, we had a talk last week on inclusivity in education. We had a talk two weeks ago on composing and lockdown, and those subjects seem rather more immediate than um, a single work by Ferdinand Ries. 
So I've tried my best to make it inclusive and I've been inspired by Dr. Henley, who last week did a, a Menti presentation. And can you see this on, on the screen now? I, I, I've done a bit of mentying. So if you'd like to grab your smartphones or go on your internet browsers or whatever, uh, www.menti.com and type in the code 659481, then you can interact with at least part of this presentation. Um, I must say, I, I did think this was quite fun last week. Oh yes, someone's already loved the presentation. I've only just started it and someone's given me a heart. That is lovely. You can also give me a cat or a thumbs up or a thumbs down. <laughs> uh, there we are, cat, thank you. That's lovely, excellent. Right, I have a question for you. Here it comes. What words do you think of when I say can share say? Um, I hope you'll forgive the kind of slightly primary school nature of this, but I, I do think it ought to reveal certain, um, oh, look, this is already great. Box office, dialogue, soloist, orchestra. Okay, this, this is ego, ego, wow. Okay, someone's winning here, this is great. Virtuosity, competition, look at that, okay. Fascinating. I'll keep this, uh, this word thing going for a while. Feel free to, to keep contributing. Uh, if you look up the Grove article for Concerto, it's Paul Griffiths that wrote it. Uh, and he points out at the very top that the Latin concertare, uh, from which Concerto derives, uh, me has a double meaning in Latin. It means uh, to contend or to dispute, which seems to go along the lines of um, dialogue and uh, um, struggle that someone's written here struggle i like struggle uh it also means uh to agree <laughs> or to support uh, so it's got this double meaning uh, agree or support might be if you were looking for an orchestra to accompany your concerto and I, i'm i'm very keen to emphasize to students all the time that a concerto uh, is it never has an accompaniment it has an equal other part we can forget this because we spend so much time playing concertos with the rehearsal pianist or, or, or the piano reduction. It, 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 it seems to, to somehow belittle the role of the, the, the significant other part. Uh, I want us to talk a little bit in this presentation about what concerto actually means, because for Ferdinand Ries, it seems to mean distinctly different things from the first version of this concerto to the second version. And just to give away what I'm gonna uh, conclude this presentation with, the first version, the unheard version, the original version, seems to be a proper competition or dialogue uh, between orchestra and soloist in a way that the second version is absolutely not. The second version seems to be a showcase for the soloist's ego, to use uh, some of your words. So um, it seems that in the decade and a bit that, um, that elapsed between him writing and then eventually publishing the piece, his idea of what a concerto is actually changed. Now, um, if you're a fan of concertos, this is the plug bit, you might want to hear the premiere of this piece, which is going to be next year, January the 16th, uh, in Brighton. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing a home match to begin with. Uh, my plan is to bring it to the college and give a historically informed performance on Forte Piano, which I will direct from the keyboard so I'll do a um, uh, I'll do a more scholarly rendition uh, later on perhaps and then I might also play the second version as well in a different setting so I'm, I'm doing lots of um, performance based research around this piece and I'm excited but of course it's all TBC because everything's TBC so we just have to uh, hope for the best with that one but it's uh, it's in the diary if only in pencil second question of the day what word of, what word do you think of when I say Ferdinand Reese? And you could be churlish here uh, and or, or honest and just say nothing. Oh, wow. <laughs> Beethoven, whoever's put Beethoven, great. I was hoping someone would. Um, yeah, I like that. Who, who's that? Brilliant, okay. Beethoven's buddy, nice. 
Well, get this. He is known as Beethoven's buddy. Um, Beethoven sort of sticks to Ferdinand Reese rather like um, ectoplasm. <laughs> Uh, he can never ever get away from Beethoven's presence. He actually only spent two years as Beethoven's student. During that time, he also um, acted as Beethoven's secretary and as Beethoven's copyist. Um, but really, his his reputation is built on um, his association with Beethoven. A little cartoon here. Um, I, I'm aware I'm sort of casting Beethoven as the sort of pantomime villain of the piece, and I, I don't mean to. Um, but when you have um, so much presence, when you're, you've got the kind of um, uh, the aura or, or, or the spectre that, that, that Beethoven has over the first half or the first few decades of the 19th century, it can be difficult to get your elbow in. And I think Ferdinand Ries has struggled with that to some extent. But then again, he built his career on Beethoven's association. He corresponded with Beethoven uh, throughout his life. He organized performances of Beethoven's pieces. And towards the end of his life, he wrote a biography of Beethoven, which is an important primary source for um, Beethoven scholars as well as Ries scholars. But actual one-to-one -one contact, only two years between the two men, not many, but sig some significant things happened during that time, not least the premiere of the Eroica Symphony for which Rees acted as copyist. Uh, famous story, Rees called out the first horn uh, during the rehearsal of Eroica for coming in early. Of course, the first horn is supposed to come in early during the uh, first movement of that piece. It's, it's part of the musical joke. Uh, Rees didn't realize this and received a clobbering from his uh, teacher and mentor. Uh, Ferdinand Rees cartoons are less prevalent on the internet than the uh, Beethoven ones. Uh, I could only find one, uh, but there he is nonetheless. Now, um, the rest of this presentation is going to take place on PowerPoint because I want to show you all sorts of manuscripts and other primary source material that I couldn't find a way of um, putting up on Menti. However, I will keep this window open during the presentation so that you can write questions, so you can chat, so uh, uh, we can look at it at the end and see what um, people have said. So in that way, the interaction continues, even though I'm transferring over to PowerPoint. And here begins the meat and veg of the presentation. Folks, you are looking at Ferdinand Ries's thematic catalogue. Uh, he spent some time in the last decade of his life uh, cataloguing all of his pieces via opus number. Um, I think it tells you something about the composer that he bothered to do this. Um, he's definitely following the practices of Beethoven by canonizing his works. Uh, this is just a single page and you can see the opus numbers down the left hand side. Then the title of the work, the instrumental forces, the publisher, the place uh, of composition and the date. And then on the right hand side we've got a uh, a little snippet of the first couple of bars of each piece. The piece we're looking at today is that one, published as Opus 123, published as the sixth concerto. It was actually the first concerto he wrote, but published much later as the sixth. Um, this might be quite small, but you ought to be able to make out Bonn 1806. Uh, Ferdinand Ries was from Bonn, same town as Beethoven. Uh, the Rieses and the Beethovens knew each other. Beethoven's dad, Franz, uh, sorry, Ries's father, Franz Ries, taught Beethoven violin, which is where the connection started. At this stage in Ries's life, 1806, he's finished his studies with Beethoven and he's been called up for military service. Uh, he actually doesn't do any because he's blind in one eye, but he didn't know that. It's extraordinary to think that um, uh, you could get to the age of uh, 24 years at this stage um, and, and not yet know that, that you're blind in one eye, but that seemed to be the case. They rejected him for military service, so he used his time to write a concerto. Now, just to draw your attention to the work above this one, written in London in 1823, and then the one after, written in Gottesburg 
in 1824. Uh, he was living in London until 1823 and then retired back to Germany. Um, he seems to have published this earlier concerto along with a few others as a way of raising money for his move. He bought quite an expensive villa, so this there seems to be a strong financial motive behind publishing this piece. Hence the uh, scattergun approach to dates. Now, Ferdinand Rees scholars, and there are about half a dozen of us, uh, have pointed out that many dates in Ferdinand Rees's thematic catalogue seem to be a bit skew with. He was a very organised and fastidious uh, composer and conductor of his own affairs, but he seems to have had a bit of a problem with dates. Stephen Robinson, who actually I stood next to singing uh, at the University of Manchester, we were both members of the chorus, it's where my association with Rees started, uh, he pointed out that this is a, a something of a catalogue of errors. Uh, this date at the top, 1814, seems to be a bit off for the pastoral concerto. Uh, nonetheless, I think he's right, actually, about Bonn, 1806. I've had to do a bit of musicological detective work in order to ascertain precisely when these pieces, or these versions of the same piece, were written. Because that's kind of important if I want to declare my piece as the original version. I need, I need to be completely sure. So um, this is the title page of the manuscript. There's no date on this, but he does say uh, that it's the autograph of the first Fassum, which is version. Well, we can see everything else that's written here is in a different language. That's German. And then we've got French above it. Obviously, that's a, a different hand. Um, that was written afterwards. Sixth Concerto, Opus 123. Um, there's a watermark. Now, this tells us that the paper is French. Uh, the musicologist Jan Leroux did uh, a lot of investigation into watermarks of the early 19th century and says a bunch of grapes, which this appears to resemble, indicates French paper. I was very um, pleased to see my uh, friend and colleague Maria Stratagude nodding vigorously when I said that at the University of Manchester back in January. And she would know uh, in relation to works by Louise Ferranc. So French paper. Well, Bonn was French territory in 1806, but given the neatness of this manuscript, and it was actually fantastically easy to typeset with hardly any issues, given the neatness, I reckon it's a smart copy he wrote in order to try and tout business with French publishers. He was living in Paris unsuccessfully, as it happens, between 1807 and 1808, um, looking for work, trying to establish himself, and not succeeding. So we're looking here at French paper. We're looking certainly at an early 19th century manuscript. The paper is the same as works by Cherubini from the same period and the same city. So that would seem to support what Rees has said. Look at the title, very French. He's, he's clearly um, uh, trying his very, very best to make a success of things in Paris. Right, here's the first page of music. It's a pretty multilingual piece. Down the left-hand side, we can see titles of instruments in Italian, and we can see violin parts on top, Alto is the third stave, and then cellos and basses on one stave down the bottom, wind, brass, and clavicembalo below, because we haven't entered the era of pianoforte yet, um, in between. I've been talking for too long, and I want you to listen to some music. And I did test this with very kind colleagues before everyone turned up. So I'm hoping to beam into your front rooms now um, some notes, what you're going to hear is the later version of the piece. So this is the only recording in existence. It's a very good recording by Christopher Hinterhuber and the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, uh, but it's of the later version. Obviously, the original version hasn't been published yet. Um, you'll notice a few differences. You'll notice some significant differences towards the end of the passage I want to play you. Um, but you know, follow, follow the original version along and see if you can spot the difference. Here it comes.
you can tell he's a pupil of Beethoven, right? <laughs> um, he's moved to the relative minor quite early in the later version. You possibly would have spotted that, although I was a bit late showing you uh, slides during that excerpt, so apologies for that. Um, you may have spotted, if you were quick, that he's added extra notes there and there. Now, with the other melodies in the piece, I mean, they remain intact, actually. Um, this one he's added extra notes to, um, and I think I know why. Um, the tune sounds a lot like this piece. Same triadic figuration, same dotted rhythm, same move to uh, supertonic. Uh, this is the second subject from Triple Concerto by Beethoven, uh, which is also in C major. This is how it appears in the recapitulation. Um, Reese would have known this piece, but it wasn't published. <laughs> I often say, um, oh, I probably shouldn't admit this on a live stream, but um, when it comes to the whole plagiarism issue in students, I, I say, you know, it's fine to be inspired by things, but don't cheat. And if you do cheat, for goodness sake, don't <laughs> make sure no one notices. Well, look, Beethoven has written triple concerto. Reese has copied it out for Archduke Rudolf, and then he's remembered this tune and he's thought, hey, I could make something of this. I could base the whole concerto on it. And he has done. Is that cheating? Well, it, it's pretty close to the original, but it's an entirely different piece. I would say, I mean, it, it still has the triple concerto vigor and energy, but um, I'd say it's a piece in its own right, despite the Beethovenian overtones. I think that extra note is, is an ironic eyebrow, uh, rather along the lines of Roger Moore saying, yep, I know I've copied that tune, but there it is, deal with it. Other differences. You may have detected from the manuscript much busier bassoon and horn part in the original version. Uh, those notes are high, although horn is transposing down the octave. Uh, that doesn't exist in the later version, which you can see on the right hand side of this page uh, by way of contrast. Also, um, open string activity uh, in the violins and violas, uh, significant in the first version, ironed out in the later version. The later version is altogether a much more, um, a much smoother and less rustic affair. Okay, so some changes in the orchestration, changes in the melody. This is pretty small beer so far. These are not big changes. Uh, there are big changes and they'll come later on. But for now, let me just give you an overview of the entire manuscript by showing you the very end of the piece. You know, this is, there are three movements. This is the end of the third movement and we've got two great big C major chords in the orchestra and we've got the piano spinning away there with a, a dizzying uh, C major arpeggio. Uh, you might think okay that's a pretty standard end to a concerto and given our 21st century a 21st century perspective you'd probably be right thinking of uh, Rack 2 and Tchaikovsky and it's normal for us to have the soloist and the orchestra finishing together but in 1806 it, it was almost always, well, I'm, I'm going to say always, I'm, I'm hesitating. I'll tell you why in a moment. It was always the case that the orchestra would finish on their own. Now, the soloist would join in with that, usually, or he or she would sit there looking awkward, awkward until the applause starts. But a final ritornello was the conventional end for a concerto in 1806, but not in Ferdinand Reese's um, compositional guise here. He's, he's very clearly unified the soloist with the orchestra in these final few bars and I do think that's distinctively different to other concertos of the time. I'm expecting that Menti is red hot right now with um, examples of concertos where soloist and orchestra finish together but I'm not aware of any pre-1806 just yet. Okay if you want to be pedantic about this then um, the soloist actually finishes after the orchestra and he's been very precise about rests following the final chord in the orchestra and the release of the pedal which is what that that marking is there from the piano so he wants resonance to finish the piece rather than um uh, big noisy orchestral chords he had a bit of a thing about pedaling uh, and journalists at the time pointed out uh, reese's romantic wildness and his liberal use 
of pedals. That's what the London music crits in the harmonicon uh, pointed out in 1824. So um, important for pianists to use a lot of pedal in Reese. Okay, I promised you a bit of a bio of this composer uh, and you're gonna get it. We left him in Paris, not making very much money at all. Um, he goes to Vienna, returns to Vienna. He's, he makes much more of a success second time around and he meets, uh, he makes professional contacts sufficient to undertake a touring schedule across Europe. Um, he goes everywhere. He spends a whole year in Russia. We don't know much about what he got up to there um, because there doesn't appear to be the documentation or at least I haven't discovered it yet. However, during that time he composes his most successful piece which is a different concerto in C sharp minor and actually that's the one I did my DMA thesis on when I studied as Barbara said in the States. Uh, it's a very romantic work in C sharp minor. The piano writing is altogether different from uh, his compositions previously and I believe it's because he had a strong association with the Irish composer John Field who was living in Russia at the time. Uh, there's no documentation to prove this, but we can see in several of Reese's works um, clearly bars <laughs> that have uh, in some cases literally been lifted from uh, compositions by Field. Is it plagiarism? Is it pastiche? Is it just uh, being a magpie and learning about the most pioneering developments of the time? Perhaps all three. Um, but it's definitely there. I would go as far as to say his association or purported association with Field was as significant, if not more, than his association with Beethoven. It really does transform his piano writing into something that we would understand as, as Chopin-esque. But Chopin is a, is a mere, um, well, Chopin doesn't exist at this time. So it's ahead of its time. Okay, uh, he has to leave Russia quickly. Napoleon invades. Uh, he arrives in London. He settles in London. He gets married. Uh, he makes a professional success of himself by uh, getting elected to the RPS. This means he can organise lots of performances of his own works. He was a, a, a symphonist. Also works by his former teacher. And this is where the correspondence with Beethoven really takes off. However, he does fall out with the other directors and in particular uh, Joseph Kramer, uh, who he refers to frequently in letters as an ass. Um, he, he starts to become a bit cantankerous, he resigns. As I mentioned, quickly publishes some quite significant pieces and then moves back to the Rhineland with his family in 1824. He's um, only 40, so when um, some Reese experts call this a retirement, I have to wonder whether it's not a bit early. Okay, I'm, I'm dazzling you guys with diagrams, but this is a, a chronological list of Reese's concertos from one to nine. I just want to emphasize here that, that it's a bit higgledy-piggledy in terms of um, when he's written them and when they're published. And of course, he's not the only composer for whom this is the case. Beethoven and Chopin spring to mind as composers whose concertos are out of order. Um, there's our top one, his first orchestral piece, the one we're looking at today, published as number six. Also published in this batch are his second concerto and his, uh, well, the sixth concerto to be written. That's a fun one, the pastoral concerto. It's like pastoral symphony, but in concerto form, uh, replete with birds, uh, storm sections, and um, it's a good programmatic piece if any pianists are interested. Uh, the final one of the batch, uh, he did write uh, contemporaneously with, with it being published, and it, I mean, he's, he's publicising his professional move. Look at that, Farewell to England. His next concerto four years later is Hello to the Rhineland. So um, he's sort of telling everyone what he's up to through the medium of his concertos. Big part of his output. Okay, that's a, um, a media article, which uh, is also telling us about his, his move. I think he wanted people to know He'd left London and was arriving in, in Germany, but it, it didn't really have any professional success when he moved back. And this is part of the reason we don't play Reese's pieces today. Um, they didn't really survive his move away from London and back to Germany. 
nevertheless, this is how our focus piece was published in Vienna by Sauer and Liedersdorf. Um, that's the title page of the solo piano part. Um, it looks good, doesn't it? It's a pretty illustration. Um, the dedica dedicatee is Marie de Escalaise. This is great. He doesn't know this person. Uh, they've never met. And he has form, actually. He dedicated a concerto to Clementi before um, he'd met Clementi. Clementi was an important professional contact as a publisher and as a, a big cheese in London musical circles. So a good idea to dedicate a piece to someone before you actually turn up there and start to make a living. Did he have ambitions to go back to Vienna and make a success? Possibly. Uh, this woman is the daughter of a rich Viennese banker. Uh, he might have met her when she was four, <laughs> um, but not since. At this stage, when he publishes the piece, she's uh, 21 years old. She's an aspiring pianist. Uh, she's got the latest instrument in her house. Uh, and Ferdinand Ries thinks, wouldn't it be great if I have my piece sitting on the piano desk for everyone to see? Um, I think that would um, do my career a lot of good. At least that's what I'm theorising. Uh, what other reason is there if he's not met this woman before? This is what the sheet music looks like. Now, important to say that when concertos in this period were published, they were published with just the solo piano music and no orchestral part other than tutties. So if you look at the last bar of this example, uh, that's the tutti part um, written out in small note heads. It looks pretty flash, doesn't it? This is the sort of thing that um, would look great on your music stand when, when someone comes around to the house. Loads of semi quavers loads of um, good virtuosic material um, to show that whoever's playing it is probably pretty good at the piano. It sounds cynical, but I genuinely think that is the rationale behind Reese changing a lot of the music from the first version to make it more difficult, more flashy, more romantic and more unnecessary, actually, as, as we'll come to um, discover later on. OK, so this is the manuscript on which the later version of the piece is based. Um, I'm just going to blow up the top right hand corner. This is where some confusion arises, because this manuscript is dated Bonn 1806. Uh, but underneath that, it says End goal fasum, so final version. Now, this is a manuscript that has distinctly not been written in 1806. When Arteria did their uh, 2009 edition, they said this is the 1806 version. And I'm saying, well, actually, I, I don't really think it is. Uh, and here's part of the reason. There's a metronome mark on this manuscript. Well, the metronome hadn't been invented in 1806. Might as well, um, didn't produce that until 1815-ish. And the watermarks on this manuscript are pretty conclusive because they have dates. Three different dates, actually, is 1813, 1817 and 1819. This shows that he's produced his final version over quite a long period of time, unless he just had the paper kicking around his house. It's really impossible uh, to know, but it seems on the face of it that he spent a long time working on the second version of this piece. It's it sort of pestered him for a while. OK, um, it's going to be very, very difficult for me to point out all the changes between the versions because there are so many. Uh, these are two comparable pages from the second movement. Left hand side is first version. Right hand side is later version. And you can see just just on a glance, the piano music here with all its uh, arpeggios and all its activity is much busier in the second version. Um, the thing we're missing is the flute part here in the original, which is an echo of the, the tune for this movement, which is... It's, it's, it's a pretty pastoral melody, uh, and it's absent entirely from the um, later version, I think, because okay you write something interesting in the orchestra but if it doesn't go in the sheet music no one's going to know about it so it doesn't really 
add much to uh, the compositional design. He's taken the focus away from the orchestra and into the piano part. Um, and that's just one difference. There are a huge number of others. This is just the first movement. The first version is significantly longer, 50 bars longer. Uh, and that's mainly because of the increased presence of the orchestral part in the original version. Again, I'm dazzling you with um, diagrams and information, but I've, I've done a bit of an analysis using Jan LaRue's uh, analytical system. It's a structural analysis. I've indicated themes using uh, algebraic uh, figures, P for primary, S for secondary, T for transitional, K for closing, etc. And you're looking at the first Ritmello and the differences between the two versions. If I just draw your attention to those yellow boxes, we can see in the first version that he's actually developing his thematic material already in the first Ritmello. Um, secondary theme there and a primary theme um, being played around with and thus increasing the length. Also, look at that, a section in the relative minor, hence six, which is 28 bars in version one and 14 bars in version two. So double the length in the original version. And the, the relative minor has a big presence in this work, a much more austere presence. But interrupted cadences are at the end of the exposition and the recapitulation of this concerto in the original version. And it's quite a jarring effect for the soloist to, 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 to finish um, quite a significant patch of playing with the wrong chord from the orchestra. And it shows that there's really a, an oppositional um, dialogue being created between the orchestra and the soloist in the first version, entirely absent from the second version. So we've got more symphonic ritonellos, we've got more in the way of minor mode, and we've got a more extreme approach to dynamics. I know dynamics are, are relative, but I do think it's significant that in version one, they range from PP to FF, whereas in version two, it's dumbed down to some extent. They range from P to F only. I think that tells us about the ambition of this young composer. that He's, he's just used uh, more extreme markings in the first version. And in the last movement, in the original version, he actually uses PPP and FFF, again, absent from the um, more professional, if you like, later version. This is perhaps most significant when the soloist actually starts playing. And it's a, it's a pretty modest way to start a concerto. It becomes busier as, as it goes on. But you can see there in the orchestral part, in the bars before the piano comes in, a thinning out of the instrumental texture and a decrescendo, and then a general pause. It's like they're sort of sweeping the carpet, waiting for the soloist to, to come in. It's definitely in support of the soloist. Well, here's the original version. Same entrance in the final two bars by the keyboardist, but enormous great hammer blows from the orchestra in advance of the soloist coming in. Very much of the manner of Beethoven's third concerto, which Reese studied with the composer. Uh, Joseph Kerman uh, talks about the orchestra trying to, trying to ward off the soloist before those great big uh, minor scales come in at the beginning of um, concerto number three. So it's, it's definitely a Beethovenian dynamic between orchestra and soloist in the way that the second version isn't. So the relationship between soloist and orchestra is fundamentally changed. Here's a page from the finale. The finale is great fun. It's, as you would expect, a rondo. The rondo tune is, is very camp. So um, we can see fragments of that tune uh, sort of scattering its strato style amongst the orchestra in this coda. That doesn't happen in the original, uh, sorry, in the later version. This is the original version. Um, we can also see here, just in the piano part there, we've got uh, lots of double thirds, very much in the manner of um, Beethoven's Opus 2 set of piano sonatas. 
uh, and really just, just sort of figuration. The most important aspect here is the orchestral fragments, and they're not there in the, in the later version. The piano writing, I would say, throughout the original version is much more classical and less what I've called, in inverted commas, salon. Um, this is the difference in instruments that occurred in the first few decades of the 19th century. So that's Beethoven's piano from uh, 1802 on the left-hand side, and then the Broadwoods that were springing up in London around the 1820s, an entirely different construction, much more substantial, um, but much better build, much able to, much more able to withstand thicker textures and uh, more romantic wildness, if you will. This is the beginning of the development in the original version. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to play this because it doesn't really sound very good on, on solo piano. The, the, the piano is playing in octaves. The orchestra have the tune split up into fragments and spread around the ensemble. And that's, that's really a crucial part of the focus here, sort of in proper dialogue with the piano part. This is what happens at the same place in the second version. And if you sort of cast your eyes down to the bottom stave of the first page here, um, the orchestra established G minor and the orchestra, well, I'll play it. The soloist embarks on what is essentially a flashy cadenza. <laughs> very flash, all very um, virtuosic, but it seems to undermine the compositional, integ compositional integrity that the orchestra aren't do any, doing anything at this point. And even when the lento starts, uh, three lines up from the bottom, uh, straight out of John Field with these great big thick left hand chords that wouldn't sound all that great on um, Beethoven's instrument but, but he's put them in here to, to, to really make the full use of the new capacity that these instruments had. Okay so that's just a flavour of some differences between the two versions. Um, it's almost time for some concluding remarks. Uh, Robert Schumann in 1839 uh, wrote a series of articles for his um, magazine uh, New Musical Times uh, where he took on the concerto as, as a genre and uh, made some quite critical remarks about it and he pointed at certain composers mostly Parisian actually Count Brenner, Henri Ertz and said uh, these are composers of um, formulaic concertos that their works are sort of prisoners of the salon style. Uh, I reckon he probably would have leveled that criticism at the later version of Reese's concerto. But he didn't. Actually, he singled out Reese for uh, um, writing good concertos, probably because he was only familiar with one of them, the C sharp minor concerto that his wife played many times. Um, I hope, I think, well, I'm sure actually, that by publishing the original version of this concerto for the first time, we not only can make an interesting contextual comparison between the two versions and the works of Beethoven, to be fair, because we can never quite get away from them. Not only that, we can also just enjoy the piece in its own right as a dramatic, energetic display of dialogue between orchestra and soloists uh, that I hope people will enjoy in January and hope they enjoy at the college when I bring it there at some point next year. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Adam, for a really fascinating um, and detailed discussion. Um, and looking forward to, to hearing it when you perform it at RNCM next year. Um, Thank you. But I'm, I'm very keen that uh, first, so who would like to start? We've got a, a system up here um, if you're indicating you you want to 
put your hand up um, under the managed participant. We've also got the people who are following on YouTube who are perhaps have been posting questions. Here we are. Will we start with one of these Menti questions? There's one here. Ad, um, Adam. I reckon Jeff Thompson has written this. I could be wrong. In your opinion, we had a conversation about uh, Reese's horn writing. How did Reese not know about the early horn as he was the copyist? Oh, you mean this is the uh, this is the Beethoven story, uh, or is the story apocryphal? Right. Yes. Well, um, well, you know, when when you, <laughs> it's it's a great question. Um, we we're not sure how much of the symphony Reese actually copied out. Um, and when, when you're doing a copying job, I would say, you know, you take one stave at a time. You may not be looking at the thing in the round. Um, now, he tells the story. It's his own story that features in his uh, biography of Beethoven. So he's responsible for it. And he seems more than happy to put his hand up and say, yeah, you know what? I got a clobbering from Beethoven for not spotting that the horn's supposed to come in early. So um, who knows how he missed it when he was when he was copying. But that's that's the history as far as I know. I'm, I'm going to mark it as answered, if that's all right. Barbara, shall I just sort of go through these ones and then um, and then we can take more from the floor? Would that be all right? I'm going to do it. K271 finishes with soloist. Oh, here we go. It also begins after a couple of bars soloist and first movement, but that's unusual. Right, I need to look up Mozart 271. There we are. I knew there would be examples. This is the good thing about giving talks is that you learn things. Yeah, interesting that he writes in English. Where, how did he learn? He was pretty proficient in English before he arrived in London. Um, I mean, with his position in Bonn as, as a sort of Franco-German territory, I think he was pretty uh, skilled at picking up languages quickly. Um, I mean, I always find the Italian thing interesting because he uses it so much in his scores. Um, he was, his family, it's a pretty educated family, all sort of bound up with the um, Masonic Lodge. So he's got many contacts there that he's drawing upon in order to uh, educate himself fully. Uh, and his brothers uh, were also um, pretty impressive in their own professions. Is there any evidence from Reese's own accounts of any intention to reflect, parody, borrow from Beethoven? Oh, that's a great question. So good. Um, well, there is some evidence that he was a bit shy about um, how much he'd reflected, parodied or, or borrowed from Beethoven. He uh, dedicated his second symphony to Beethoven, um, but then he never ever sent Beethoven a copy, despite Beethoven asking for it many times. He never sent it. Uh, and scholars have pointed out a couple of bars which appear to have been lifted from, from some of Beethoven's works. And the fact he didn't send it, I mean, he, he could have very easily done so, suggests that um, maybe he was just a bit embarrassed about it. This tells us something about the relationship between Reese and Beethoven, because it's written about as in very sort of chummy terms. They were great friends. Uh, I'm, I'm not so sure. Beethoven rather snarkily said, well, if you don't send me a copy of your symphony, then I won't dedicate my next piece to your wife. And he never did. <laughs> and he didn't dedicate one to Reese either. So um, that tells us something, I would say. Right, done that one. Why do you describe the third movement theme as camp? <laughs> I think it probably says more about me than about the third movement. <laughs> um, I guess because it's pretty four square, it's, um, it's, it's got that sort of pastoral sense where it's sort of spinning through the arpeggios using a lot of um, ascending fourths and, and falling fifths. Uh, it's, it's, it's got an element of, of rustic sort of harvest festival quality. It's definitely music to dance to. Um, and music to dance to in the concert hall is usually camp because even in the 18th century, people were generally sit sitting, you know, they, they were chatting and eating and playing cards, but they, were, they weren't often dancing. So in that way, I'm going to call it camp because it's popular music in a different setting. Oh, that raises all sorts of issues. Maybe that will generate more questions than, than, it's, <laughs> than it's answered. Right, which version do you like best? Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose I would say this because I've written it all out, but it's definitely the original version because of the um, fantastic energy and, and the dialogue between orchestra and soloist. Um, I love playing concertos, but I would hate the idea of turning up as a sort of soloistic diva 
to a rehearsal and say, right, okay, this concerto is all about me. Um, you guys are just the accompanist, so I'm going to sit here and play it. And I won't talk to anyone in the orchestra. I always advise students never ever to approach a concerto that way because you'll never ever be asked back. Um, and I've managed to sort of generate quite a few you know, wonderful relationships with um, you know, pro-am and, uh, and, and professional and amateur orchestras, you know, you know which, well, I've, I've found it ever so rewarding to have the opportunity to play, you know, Grieg, Rack II and all, all the sort of classics. And then strange ones like Reese and the Island Concerto and uh, uh, Ludoswavsky, which don't often get played. But I can sort of generate these performances because uh, I think orchestras, you know, have, well, what I've said, you know, found it quite easy to work with because I follow the conductor and, and, and don't, um, don't be a diva. So um, I suppose I would say that. Sorry, Barbara. Could we have a question from, I've got people, a few people with their hands up. Brilliant. Yeah, sorry, um, I'm rattling through. Um, so is, is that okay to mix them a little bit? Just um, can we have Harvey, my, my internet connection is rubbish, so I apologise in advance if I disappear. Harvey Davis, he's got a question for you. Hi, Adam. Thanks. Hey, so, I, I'm so pleased to hear people talking about um, this period, can I just say, for the first time, um, for the first thing I, I want to mention, because it is so incredibly, apart from Beethoven, obviously underrepresented in scholarship, generally speaking. Um, and given the importance and, and the context of Beethoven, um, the importance of Beethoven, and we, we need to understand his context better musically. And uh, uh, this period has been a passion of mine for um, decades now. So I'm, I'm delighted that you're, that you're adding to the field of scholarship here. Um, it certainly seems to me that um, the, I do know this piece actually, um, interestingly, and the, the, it seems to me that the, the principal reason, and I wonder if you'll agree with this, um, for the version that he rewrites and then eventually submits for publication in, uh, um, in the 1820s, is principally not because he's changed his mind about the piece, but because he is responding to the pressure of public passion. Um, and it was incredibly powerful at that point, wasn't it? And, um, you know, when you read something like the Harmonicon with its incredibly opinionated uh, views and so on, it, it goes on and on about, about this kind of thing and the, and the, the sort of the, the way music is um, either fashionable or not fashionable, depending and so on. What, what do you think? Would you, would you concur with that view or, or not? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 100% the conclusion that I'm drawing is that he's pandering to, um, if you like, the increased demands of the public forum, which is the concerto, by, by making these changes. Um, mm. Mm. You've got to bear in mind that at this stage, the sort of Saturday night concert, if you like, is, is going undergoing a um, sort of parabolic uh, curve of, of popularity. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's the, this is a bit churlish, but I'm going to do it. It's the X factor of its time, you know, yeah. so... Of we've got everyone rocking up and they, they want to hear someone do some stunts and he's given them that opportunity by um, putting them all in, in, in this piece uh, and changing it as necessary. Um, now, that would have made him some money and it would have made him some success. But I mean, this sort of tells us a bit why we don't really know about Ferdinand Ruiz because of these compromises that he's made to his artistic integrity a bit, I would say. Maybe that's a bit unfair, but that's why I think he held on to this original version. He didn't destroy it because if he, if he felt so strongly that the changes he made were good, then he, he wouldn't have kept it. He didn't with yeah. any of his other pieces. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, I can't wait to, to give this version an outing, actually. Not that I especially mind, you know, commercial music. Actually, I rather like it, you know, and, and um, <laughs> um, it, it is I mean, whoever put box office as, as the answer to what does concerto mm -hmm. mean, I mean, you know, that does it's an important factor for performers however much you work with the orchestra you've, you've got to put on a show because that's why you've been booked really to um sell some tickets and make sure the orchestra have the freedom to perform what they want in the second half because <laughs> that usually isn't box office you know? indeed, indeed. <laughs> uh, could it could it thank you um for that so that, uh, brilliant answer and uh, i mean there are several other possibilities perhaps we'll talk about this privately and um, that, that i've thought of for that but i just wonder um Presumably, he did the rewriting and 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 this this um, fair copy of of the work while he was in London, as there are watermark dates on the paper. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, the, either that, or he took the paper with him. 
the, the paper's English. Uh, um, right, I know, but he, um, so be, because he, he, well, he could have taken it with him, I suppose. Well, um, are you ready for this? Because it, it, I'm king nerd when it comes to paper. Now I've read this article, <laughs> don't, don't all this research. Um, but uh, it was law in England until 1811. Ah, uh, yes, I know this. You know this, that you have to put the date on a piece of paper. Yeah. Uh, and when it stopped being law, they just did it anyway because they didn't want to change their the way they were publishing paper. So, so British paper or English paper, I should say, has dates on in a way that some continental paper doesn't. Mm. Um, so that makes it very easily identifiable. Uh, also, one of those dates has a, a manufacturer of paper attached, which is Simmons, uh, mm. which is a London-based paper manufacturer. So it very clearly, very helpfully for me, says, right, that's the London version, that's the French version, so we can be very, very clear about this. Cool. I'm sure lots of people would be very envious of that. I'm thinking of Maria, who's in this, this meeting, if, if, if every manuscript had dates on it. Can we have a question from David Horn, please? Hi, Adam, thanks very much. That was an absolutely yeah. terrific, terrific talk. Uh, I'm sorry, that was me that put the thing about K271. It is the case. I it would be. <laughs> But it's, it's the only one, and it's incredibly rare. And, and the piano actually begins almost at the beginning of the first movement as well. I had a, my question was um, about when you were talking about the, the ver kind of like that high horn par. So just so I'm clear, and I didn't misunderstand, so does he excise that later? Sorry, does what, the high horn? Yeah. Right, well, um, yes, he does. The, the, the horn part in the first version is, um, is higher and busier throughout is uh, i mean my thought on, on that was i mean jack adler mccain is here so he would have a much better response but it's actually really difficult um not only because it's really high but it's skipping harmonics and i would have thought it'd sound quite bad so i'm just wondering i mean i'm not i'm not in any way kind of undermining the the thought that that maybe this this first version is better but if we can show that there are some things that he's clearly doing to enhance it then then maybe there is some thoughtfulness in the process yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have been a bit crude by sort of, because it's my job really to sort of come down on one side or the other, you know, it's a sort of classic you know, debating society skill thing. And I'm, I'm going to come down on the side of original version, but you're absolutely right. We have to always remember that this is his first attempt at writing an orchestral piece. He'd not done it before, not once. And so, yes, he has tidied up some things in that second version. Um, also, he thinks it's a really good idea to do double stops, which are open fifths on violins. Everyone knows that's a really bad idea. So, but, but he's done it several times. So um, that's gonna pose a, a performance challenge. Uh, yeah, the horn writing, I mean, the horn writing got me in a bit of a fox, which is, um, I hadn't quite realized about the transposing issue. He writes it in, in two clefs, uh, treble and bass clef horn. Um, and that, that, I was completely unsure as to how that would be performed. And I asked a, a few horn players and, and um, well, I've done a bit more concrete research since that, that's shown me how it transposes up and down the octave according to the clef you use. So, um, thanks. Again. Great, great answers. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. I think Jack would like to come in on the, with a question. Thanks, Barbara. And um, thanks, Adam. Fantastic talk. And as a, as a proud Brightonian, I'm very glad to hear that the piece will be premiered there. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say I was I was fortunate enough to hear a couple of years ago um, a wonderful performance of uh, Reese's arrangement of the Eroica Symphony for Piano Quartet. Mm -hmm. And um, two things struck me about it. One was, in fact, the only part of the piece that I felt didn't work in his transcription was indeed the horn trio from the from the scherzo. So maybe that has some reflection on his horn writing. But the other thing that really, my, my main question is that the main thing I was lacking was what I felt was jarring, at least in, in the performance I heard, was the modern piano, because I felt like it just didn't create the kind of resonances with the strings that I had in my head for that piece, at least. So I'm wondering how your approach to performing the piece will change, as you have not said that you're going to do it on both modern and, and historic instruments, and how that might change the piece itself or your view of it. Yeah, a terrific question. Um it's going to change it a lot. There are a lot of unknowns here. I mean, I've been very lucky that I can sort of basically do the backbone of this research from my front room in, in Brighton um, during this time without access to libraries and things. I mean, I, I downloaded all sorts of stuff before and I visited Berlin at the end of last year. 
anyway, the one thing I can't do right now is try out something on a forte piano, and I, I'm really missing that. Um, I mean, I'm practicing it quite hard. There are all sorts of double thirds uh, at the end of the first movement that I can't play at speed on modern piano. They just sound horrendous. And I'm thinking, aha, forte piano might really help me out here. Um, so, okay, that's the practical answer to your question. Other answers. It's this whole thing about pedaling because he's been ever so clear about his pedal markings. Um, and I can't wait to find out how the forte piano really responds to those. Um, he's done a lot of, uh, he pedals through tonic dominant a lot. Again, I think that's going to work on forte piano and, and not um, on modern piano. So that's a big factor. Um, what else? You know, he's written one note in the third movement that I think goes beyond the range of the instrument that he would have been writing for in 1806. But he's again following the practice of Beethoven there because Beethoven wrote for a load of extra notes in the third concerto that, that he didn't have. He was predicting the future. So um, it's going to be fun to see if I can get an instrument which will actually handle the range. I'm not sure yet. So lots yeah. of fun. Yeah, just, just by the way, if you are needing an instrument, I know a colleague of mine here in Berlin who happens to have an ERA in his in his studio. So if you wow. need a Zoom call with someone who has an instrument to hand, then that could be arranged. Well, thank you. Okay, that's very useful. Thank you. Um, do you want to tackle some more Menti questions? You've probably got a few more that there. Plans to record, 100%. My, my dream CD, which is really only my dream, probably no one else's, is, is to have a, a CD which has both versions on it. Mm. But that's not going to be Christmas number one, is it? But it's my dream CD. Um, interesting that his opus numbers correspond more to the dates of publication than the years of composition. It's not really a question, just a comment. Yeah, he, he was massively fussy about this and, and he, he wrote letters to publishers all the time saying I, I want this to be opus 76 and this one is opus 77 and don't don't mess this up I mean he's, he's very um clearly trying to provide a narrative for his compositional output I would say and again he's following the practice of Beethoven he's also showing his um attention to detail which really makes Reese scholarship kind of easy because he's he's so um very mannered with the organization of his affairs. Are there any corrections in the manuscripts of the second version? Not really. Both manuscripts are extremely neat, uh, very, very clear, and um, don't really raise too many questions about every manuscript, which is hundreds of pages long, uh, <laughs> raises issues. But um, no, he's been quite decisive in both versions, which suggests to me they've both gone through quite a bit of um, uh, work in preparation. That's it. We have a comment from um, Harvey saying that Journey did this, exactly the same in relation to the opus numbers. Really? Yeah. Well, recent Journey had, I mean, Shirley was actually, I mean, maybe he, he wasn't conscious of this, but he was rather responsible for the panning of Reese's reputation when he, he wrote um, a remark that Beethoven was uh, reported to have said, uh, oh, Reese, he just imitates me too much. That guy, he imitates me. Uh, and that basically is written in every program note about Reese. Um, who knows if Cherney intended that. But if you read Cherney's books, he doesn't come across as an especially nice person. Oh, this is maybe, yeah, maybe that's a bit much. Reese actually seems, seems pretty laid back, humorous and diplomatic, which I mean, if you were Beethoven's secretary and copyist, you, you would kind of have to be that person. Um, but apart from the, the thing with Kramer, where where he's um, he loses his rag, he's quite um, he's quite savvy and amusing in his letters, and it doesn't really slag off anyone. Do you think it also reflects our own attitudes towards borrowing and an imitation? I mean, in there are certainly different attitudes in the past to that issue, and and maybe it reflects more our own values now than it did in that period. It's just just a thought. Yeah, a hundred percent, hundred percent. It's we're so eager, and we teach this way, so we we have to sort of take responsibility to, to you know have that original voice. If you want to get seventy plus, then you're going to have to show original content in your work, uh, and and put your own individual stamp on something that that. Um, well, you know, obviously there are fantastic reasons for that, but you do sort of remove in the process the opportunity to actually assimilate. Um, and this is what he's doing, I mean, and not just from Beethoven, but he's traveling all around Europe, uh, John Field, and um, he's, he's a magpie, he's a musical assimilator. And as someone 
you know, that likes kitsch music, that likes postmodernism. I'm attracted to that, no doubt about it. That's very interesting. I think Gavin's been wanting to ask a question. I'm not, is that right, Gavin? Yes, yeah, I've got a question. Adam, that was, it was wonderful to be uh, reacquainted with uh, Reese's music again and, and to see all this amazingly thorough work you've been doing on the concerto. Um, I've got a, a question about your own performance of the concerto as to um, how far you're going to be de delving into historical performance practice and indeed what do we know about the way these concertos might have been performed I'm sort of thinking of in terms of the role of the soloist, whether the, the soloist would actually play along in, in sort of unwritten sections of the score and so on. Yeah, that, that is a great question. Um, and it, it presents me with a bit of a quandary, actually. In the second version of this manuscript, he's um, written it out in the Mozart style, where he's put con basso um, in the piano part. So he's written out all the sort of bass notes and, and said, OK, well, this is, this is what happens here. Now, this might be a clue for the publisher to publish the piece with those bass parts written in. So um, the pianist has something to do. But it does raise the question, what do you actually do in performance? Do you literally just play left hand or do you fill in some chords? What do you do? Um, when I did um, the other Reese Concerto previously, 10 years ago, and I conducted it from the piano, I sort of, <laughs> I did 21st century conducting during the Tutti passages really, and I, I had all sorts of interesting ideas about balance and dynamics and um, you know I stood up in those bits and and indicated to the players what I wanted and it's not very historical is it but it did help the orchestra said they, they felt much happier when I was standing up <laughs> conducting from the piano is is you know it's it's a tricky one there's a lot of eyebrows going on and head movements but modern players aren't used to that so there's a, there's a practical issue there what am I going to do well I'll let you know when I play it also, I've got to come up with a cadenza for the first movement, which I'm not going to compose. I will definitely improvise that. So, um, yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Thinking about the, the improvised cadenza, are there, I mean, how are you going to approach doing that? Are you going to do it in, in the Adam Swain style or are you going to try and imitate what you think Reese might have done or? I think it's important to assimilate fully the the manner, um, I mean, this is what Robert Levin says, he wrote an article about how to embellish um, and improvise a cadenza. Uh, and he says, you just have to become so acquainted with the style that um, that you improvise within it. I mean, I mean, there are several examples of blues cadenzas for Mozart concertos, which I really hate. I mean, it, <laughs> I don't think it works still, so I, I, won't, I won't be doing that. Um, but we'll, we'll see what comes out. It's going to be um, a really interesting exercise and I hope it's different every time. Um, I guess it was easier when I did the Shevsky People United piece to improvise a cadenza that was sort of poly stylist because the piece is and so you can kind of get away with lots of things and I found the cadenza in that particular piece a very liberating moment and I definitely want to preserve that when I perform the Reese but within as I say the early 19th century style. Mm. Thanks, thank you. Was that your dog by the way just barking? Uh, uh, possibly. I didn't, yeah. yeah, I didn't notice. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any final questions? Okay, so while we wait for that, um, I just, the number of things really, really struck me. And first of all, the RNCM has had a year looking at musical migration and, and one, one type of migration is around Europe, which was a very normal, common thing. It's fascinating to see how Reese fares differently in different cities and how that shapes or has an impact on his, his reputation. That, that's one thing. And then thinking also the importance of Reese in legacy building. So he links himself to Beethoven and that's one way of, um, of course, uh, helping to shape Beethoven's um, legacy, but also inserting himself in that legacy too, which is alongside him. So inevitably um, helping to to um, crystallize that view that we that has often been of him as Beethoven's buddy, Beethoven's sort of second um, second in command. You've hinted at a number of reasons why his music has been overlooked. And that's always a question when people say, oh, um, I'm doing this study because no one's ever done it before or that, that, that there's a gap. But but then it's then how we make the argument that that gap does need to be to be um, filled. And I think, you know, you've been very persuasive in your advocacy 
of his music, ensuring actually that this will be heard again. And there's a certain responsibility and a privilege in rethinking the past and our ability to, to change how um, we understand the past and how it will be um, regarded in the future. So um, this work, both in terms of your edition and very much in terms of your performance, all contribute to that, um, your own um, shaping of Reese's legacy. So, wow. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> if you, uh, you're welcome to respond to, to anything, uh, um, any of that, but I really want to thank you for um, giving us a very different sort of presentation today. And, and it's a reminder of the, the sheer range of the expertise of colleagues at the RNCM, and, and particularly in your case of your ability to, to look at contemporary repertoire and contemporary concerns and politics, but also that, that um, core expertise in the 19th century, which is, is really fascinating. So we look forward to the performances, make sure we all know about them and you advertise it widely. Um, and meanwhile, um, we'll see everyone next, next week. The next session is going to be Mark Herron, who's going to talk about his, his project um, with a collaboration with Norway. Um, and then we have John Miller in early June, and we have a session on the 17th of June on COVID-19 research. So if you're interested in that, please, it's wonderful to welcome colleagues from throughout the RNCM and also online. And we're really grateful and it, um, for their participation through, through Menti, we're all getting the hang of it, um, the partic their participation in this research seminar. So thank you very much, everyone, and see you all soon. Thanks, Barbara. Bye, folks. <laughs>